Mission TV Jet is here. We are enjoying this so much, and the people said. Bishop T.D. Jakes talked about his younger days and how moving it was to hear about his dad, his mom, his younger years when God called him. He was 17 years old. When he began to preach, he preached to only seven people. Can you, can you imagine this mighty man of God who is now preaching to millions? began with seven people in his church, but today the whole world knows his name. And we are so glad you're here. One more time, welcome the bishop. And dear Bishop, I am, I am really, I am totally moved by what I heard yesterday, and I can hardly wait to hear what God has to say through you today. I want to first talk about your book, Before You Do, Making Great Decisions That You Won't Regret. Tell me, what is this book about? You know, Pastor, for years and years and years as a minister, we come in on the back end of a crisis, particularly as pastors. Generally, couples don't come to us until they're about ready to break up and split. We, we don't get called to the hospital until somebody's really in a terminal situation. We, we, we're not brought into a situation about a job and they want prayer for a job until they've lost it. And, and as God began to minister to me, it became apparent he wants to be on the front end of the crisis. Yeah. On the front end of the crisis. And uh, I wrote Before You Do because I think in, in all of the universities that I've ever seen or been to or been involved in, there are no classes on making great decisions. You go to church Sunday after Sunday after Sunday, and, and we talk about making bad decisions, but we don't teach people how to make good decisions. And so I wanted to minister a message before you do. For me, when I do a book, my book is not, uh, many ministers take sermons and then they have them transcribed into books, but I don't write the way I preach. There's a different anointing to write. Sure. So when I'm, when I'm passionate about something, I kind of type my secrets into the computer and then publish them and let everybody read them. The Bible says the secret of the Lord is with them that fear him and he shall show them his covenant. So many times God whispers in the ear of the prophet things that other people don't hear. And so as I begin to write before you do, I really felt like I had the heart of God saying, you know, the Bible said, blessed is a man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, standeth in the way of sinners, sitteth in the seat of scornful. His delight shall be in the law of the Lord. It goes on down and says, whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. That's it. We can't get the prosperity, the blessings, the healings, the benefit of right decisions if we keep making of, of right blessings when we keep making wrong choices. So I believe this book is powerful for people who are on the brink of getting married or they want to get married or they hope to get married. I talk about 20 things you should know about anybody before you ever even consider opening up the do doors for marriage. I want, I want to talk about this and much more. We'll tell you how you can get the book at the end of the program. Let's begin, Bishop, with how can people find God's perfect will for their life? You know, it's, it's very important that we understand that as we begin to pray and to seek God and ask Him what His will is for our lives, that we must first ask Him that asking is the admission that His plan is better than ours. Yeah. Okay? That the asking alone is an admission. And then as we will listen for His voice, we know His word, but the real gift is knowing His voice. Because as you know, his voice, there are certain things that he will say no. The apostles spoke over and over in the book of Acts. The Spirit of the Lord will not allow us to go into this city. The Spirit of the Lord constrain me. The Spirit of the Lord. We're not listening to God's voice to understand what his will is in our lives. And so the big, there are some things that I tell people when it comes to the will of God, that God doesn't care whether I have on a blue suit or a black suit. So when you find people praying in the, in the department store over what suit to buy, they're neurotic. They need therapy. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 yeah. Yeah. <laughs> now, where we need to know God's will is where it relates to our destiny and purpose. The reason God doesn't care what color suit I have on is because it does not have anything to do with my divine purpose. So anything that has nothing to do with my divine purpose is up to me. 
That's it doesn't care whether I get a brick house or a house with siding on it unless it relates to my divine purpose. So there are some things that we just need to do because that's what we want and that's what we enjoy. And it pleases the Father to make us happy. Amen. It is, it is His pleasure to bless us. Any good father who loves his children delights in their laughter. And God wants you to be happy. Where you want to be careful is on these destiny decisions. You know, who is the woman you want me to have? Uh, what is the ministry you want me to go into? And, and a lot of times, as it relates to ministry, your ministry is often born out of your misery. If, if, if you want to know what you're called to do, look at what you can't stand. If, 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 <laughs> oh, yeah. I like that. Oh, I yeah. like that. Look at what wow. you can't stand. If, if, if we're getting ready to do a meeting and somebody said, oh, they didn't start on time, they didn't give us programs, they didn't do this, your frustration often reveals your ministry. You may have the gift of administration because you can't stand disorder and chaos and confusion. You're called to correct what you care about. That's right. Somebody who can't stand the choir is out of tune and the musician is out of key. You're called to music. What you can't, because the rest of us, it doesn't bother us. We can't hear it. It's fine. <laughs> You're, you're called to correct what you can't stand. So you must stop giving your ministry to other people and saying they ought to do something because you are the they that ought to do something. Did you hear that? That is awesome, my goodness. Now, let's talk about marriage. That's a big decision people make. You said there's 20 things in the book. Can you give us some? You know, w when we start talking about marriage, first of all, we're, we're taught to date. And the reason that we're failing, Christians and non-Christians alike are failing so terribly at marriage, we're not going into it right. When you think about dating, when you date somebody, you're not dating them. You're dating their representative. <laughs> think about that. You're, you're dating the fixed-up, canvas-colored, perfume made up individual who is ready to see you now at a particular time their hair is done their nails done they're ready to see you that's not who you marry <laughs> that's right that's not who you marry <laughs> okay so so uh, a lot of us are suffering from what they call bait and switch i used to be in a <laughs> I used to be in retail years ago. You would advertise one product to get the customer in the store and then switch to another one. Yeah. It's called bait and switch. It's illegal. That's, what, that's what's happening in our marriages. You're baited by the dating, and then you're switched in the marriage. <laughs> <laughs> and then by the time you find out that who you dated was their representative and you married who they really are, you've already got the ring on your finger, and you're suffering. <laughs> Consequently... 50% of our marriages or more end in divorce, first-time marriages. Second-time marriages, the stats go up to 63. So we're not getting better on the second marriage, we're getting worse. Because we never got rid of the baggage from the first one. We come into the second marriage still frustrated over what went wrong with the first one. Our tolerance has decreased because our age has increased. And then by the time they get to third marriage, this is a percentage of 74% of people on their third marriage end in divorce. Because first of all, you go into it saying, I'm never going to take off of you when I took off of him. You know, there's so much bitterness coming down the track. I've got a chapter in the book called Junk in the Trunk. And, uh, Whoa. Yeah, yeah. I know what it's supposed to mean, but I, I did something else with it. <laughs> If you go in anybody's trunk who has a lot of junk in it, I can tell where you've been by the junk you collect. Exactly. In the same thing that you see, you stopped by the grocery store and you left a bag in the trunk, or you stopped over here and there's, there's a McDonald's cup back here and there's this and that and there's an empty oil can, and we can tell all kinds of things about you by your junk, tells your journey. In the same sense, we collect a lot of junk in our trunk from our journey. And a person Ooh. buys us because of the exterior of the car. But then when you marry, you unlock the trunk. And you've got to live with the junk. Okay? And this, we really need to do, some of, there are people watching us right now who are frustrated.